As a reporter, I've traveled around the Middle East for many years. It's an area that has always fascinated me, but in my work, I've mainly covered its war zones, its crises, and its tragedies. This journey, which takes me down the Silk Road in the footsteps of Marco Polo, gives me the opportunity to explore the great historical and cultural significance of this part of the world, its ancient melting pot of peoples and civilizations that have contributed so much to our own. The name of the Silk Road was invented in the 19th century to describe the network of economic as well as intellectual exchanges that went on between the East and the West. We know where it ends, in Xi'an, the formal capital of the Chinese Empire. But where should it start from? From Byzantium? From Antioch? Jerusalem, perhaps? Or why not from here? From Venice, the European gateway to the Orient and the point of departure for the most famous traveller to have ever hit this road and its 16,000 kilometres, Marco Polo. Venice seems to hover between the sea and the sky. The floating city, La Serenissima, owed its splendor to its trading activities with the Levant. It was indeed an outpost of the East on the European continent. St. Mark's Basilica is a symbol of this interconnection between East and West. It was built to house the relics of Mark the Evangelist after his remains were brought here from Egypt. On its facade, the lion is an attribute of the saint and an emblem of the city. The mosaics that decorate the interior of the basilica, which is almost entirely covered in gold leaf, clearly point to Venice's direct ties with Constantinople and beyond. These mosaics show the different peoples that once engaged in trade with the Venetians. Arabs, Cappadocians, Jews, Phrygians, Asians, they're all in fact the peoples of the Silk Road. St. John of Damascus, represented here as a Turkish merchant wearing a turban, takes us back to a time when the divide between East and West was not so clear-cut, when a Syrian, for example, could be a priest in the church and could also be honored in a Catholic basilica built in the 9th century. This sculpted marble plaque from the 10th century is quite amazing. It intermingles religious symbols from both the East and the West. You can see the Christian cross, the Star of David, the Hindu swastika, the Dharma wheel, the lotus flower sacred to the Buddhists. It's very mysterious, but it's a wonderful example of intercultural communication. Many of these vestiges from the East are not really the result of communication, but rather of plunder, or what the Venetians called spolia. For example, the famous horses of St. Mark. These magnificent bronze statues once stood atop the great Hippodrome of Constantinople. But after sacking the Byzantine capital during the Fourth Crusade in the year 1204, the Venetians stole the quadriga. And ever since, like a trophy of war, the four horses have triumphantly adorned the front of the basilica, or rather, they're copies, since the original quadriga was moved inside to protect it from the pollution. In the old working-class neighborhood of Canareggio, a mosaic factory continues to practice the art of glassmaking and coloring, which the Byzantines passed on to the Venetians. An inconspicuous entry leads into one of these hidden courtyards or secret gardens that are so delightful in Venice and so similar to the ones drawn by Hugo Pratt in the adventures of Corto Maltese. The Orsoni factory restores mosaics, those from St. Mark's and from many other basilicas, and it perpetuates a very special technique that originated in Byzantium, the art of gold leaf mosaics.
Where does mosaic making actually come from? The art of mosaics in its modern form developed significantly during the Greek and Roman periods. Pompeii is a very important example of how it was already being used decoratively. The ancient mosaics in Pompeii were already being created with glass tiles that were tinted because nature does not offer the entire range of desired colors. There seems to be a sort of back and forth movement between the East and the West with regard to mosaics. It's an art that was born here in Italy during the Roman Empire, in Pompeii, for example. It traveled to Asia under the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, and then came back to Italy through Venice's merchants. Certainly, there were exchanges. It's true that glass mosaics came to us from the east. There's no doubt that the process existed in Constantinople before it was brought here to Venice during the Byzantine period. So it's obvious that knowledge and information about glass making were exchanged from east to west and then from west to east, and that it continued afterwards. How are gold leaf tesserae made? The way we make the gold leaf, the gold plates, follows the rules of the ancient Byzantine and before that Roman canons. It's a very special technique that requires several days of work. In fact, it's made like a sandwich, with the gold leaf trapped between layers of glass. We make the glass ourselves. It's a very fine-blown glass that protects the gold leaf, so that the gold leaf is placed in the middle, molten glass is then poured onto the support, and then it's all put together. Golden mosaics are still highly prized for their flamboyant beauty. Today, however, the Orsoni factory is called upon to decorate churches less often than luxury hotels or the palaces of wealthy oil emirs. In the 5th century, Attila, the leader of the Huns, who'd pushed westward from the borders of China, invaded Italy, forcing the inhabitants of the Po Valley to take refuge in the lagoon of Venice. Then, in the 13th century, it was the Venetian merchants who, with an eye for adventure and economic gain, would open up the route back to China. It was from this house in 1271 that a 16-year-old Venetian youth set out on a journey that would take him down the Silk Road to China. His name? Marco Polo. More than 20 years would go by before Marco Polo would return to this very house. He took up the life he'd led, but a few years later he was captured and imprisoned in Genoa, Venice's rival city. It was in his cell that he would turn his travel adventures on the Silk Road into the Book of Wonders, or Milioni in Italian, like the name of this house, which would become one of the greatest bestsellers of all time. These memoirs, the travels of Marco Polo, which were in fact dictated to a fellow cellmate, would feed all kinds of fantasies about the fabulous riches of the East and inspire explorers. It was one of Christopher Columbus's favorite books, for example. The commodity that fascinated Marco Polo and made China rich was, of course, silk. The fabric invented by the Chinese more than 4,000 years ago first arrived in Venice towards the beginning of the Middle Ages. Weavers from the Bevilacqua family can be seen in paintings dating back to the Renaissance, and their factory on the Grand Canal has been using the same looms since the 18th century. When did silk and brocade weaving start in Venice? In Venice, the production of velvet and brocade began in the 14th century. In other words, around 1300. The first fabrics that were produced were called shamiti, which were originally imported from the East. What is very important is that strong commercial as well as cultural ties had always existed between Venice and Constantinople, or Byzantium. The Venetians had always made the textiles for the caftans and the clothing of the Turks and the East. 
Donc les techniques so the silk weaving techniques came from the East, and then it was you, the Venetians, who made the kaftans that were worn by the Ottoman sultans. Exactly. So in fact, the silk road went in both directions. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Can you show us some damask? Of course. So this fabric originally came from the city of Damascus on the Silk Road. That's right. From Syria. And this is all silk? It's all silk. 100% silk. And could you show us an example of one of those brocades that were so precious in the Middle Ages at the time of Marco Polo? Of course. This, for example, is a brocade made with silk and metal. Brocade is a very special fabric. A silk brocade embellished with silver. With silver or with gold, which may also be used to create the design. Brocade is probably the richest kind of cloth there is because you can weave in so many different colors and thus create these multicolored designs. While damask, for example, can only have two colors. So that's the brocade. What about the velvet, the famous cut velvet? This is the soprarizzo velvet, as we call it in Venice. Here it is. That's beautiful. The soprarizzo velvet, as it's called here, was created in Venice. Have any kinds of Venetian fabric ever been found, perhaps in India or China? In China, I don't know. China already had its own tradition of textiles, and it's always been a rather closed culture, so it's hard to know. Marco Polo, on the other hand, is said to have stolen some silkworms and brought them back to Venice. Poor Marco Polo. He gets blamed for everything. If it's not the recipe for pasta that he's suspected of stealing from the Chinese, then it's the silk cocoons that he's supposed to have pocketed. And what's more, he's even been accused of making up his entire journey and of never having set foot in China. Ciao, buongiorno, un passaggio, grazie. Although the gondola has become a boat for tourists in Venice, this traghetto is certainly one of the coolest forms of public transportation I've ever been on. It's best to go early in the morning to Venice's main outdoor market near the Rialto Bridge. There, the fruit and vegetable stands sell, among other things, the famous artichokes of Venice, cacciofi. The Silk Road has left its indelible mark on Venetian cuisine, whose key ingredients are fish and spices. Irina Freguia is a specialist in the gastronomic history of the city. Give me some of the moechi, because I'm not sure I have any left. But I want them closed. Let me see them. Good. I was told they were excellent. Yes, the biggest. Yes, please. Irina's tavern, the Vecchio Fritolin, is well known among Venetians as one of the best places in the city to enjoy traditional cooking straight from the lagoon. As for the origins, whether factual or mythified, of Venetian dishes, she has all of the answers. OK, credit where credit is due. Where does pasta really come from? Did Marco Polo bring noodles back with him to Venice? Well, to be honest, some say yes, others say no. There are different theories, some maybe even from Arabia. But the very first pasta, real pasta, was made in the south, in Naples, in Sicily, in southern Italy. Down there, they might have learned something from the Chinese, but we don't know, no one knows, there's nothing written. This isn't just a patriotic Italian response. No, not at all. No. 
Would you have any specific examples of ingredients, vegetables or fruits that came from the East? Artichokes are said to have come from Arabia or Persia. They first came here around 1,500. It was specially planted on the island of Sant'Erasmo. We call them castro which means first cut. In other words, it's the first buds that are cut off, which is why they're so small. The Armenians brought fruits, apricots in particular, and sugar came from the Arabs. Then raisins arrived, the ones that are part of the Jewish culture, and pine nuts, lots of things, almost everything. Nothing grew here in Venice. There was only water, and that's it. The Silk Road is also called by many people the Spice Route. And it's true that what the Venetian merchants went off to Asia to buy in the first place were spices. And spices were so precious that they were worth more than gold. That's right. Spice was like silk, very expensive. In addition to that, there were lots of kings and merchants all over Europe who bought spices. And Venice was the only supplier. Pepper was worth a fortune. Grazie. Mueke, the soft-shelled crab from the lagoon. Do I use a knife and fork or my fingers? Always with your fingers. OK. Just like in Asia. Mmm, famoso. Not all Venetians were seafarers. Like Marco Polo, many of them set off to the east and went very far across the deserts of Central Asia. The Palazzo dei Mori, the House of the Moors, which belonged to a family of merchants, the Mastelli family, with a Bactrian camel on the outside. I think we're going the right way. These three 12th century merchants, the Mastelli brothers, are dressed up as Moors, in other words, as Arabs, wearing Middle Eastern clothing and turbans. They, in fact, came from an ancient region of Greece called, at the time, Maria. It's also believed that several Arab or Turkish merchants actually did live in this area around the Campo di Mori. There is a lovely Venetian legend about the origin of the sculpted camel, which goes like this. One of the Mastelli brothers had a Moorish fiancé who was supposed to meet up with him in Venice, but she didn't know his address. After going around the city in a gondola, she finally came upon the camel, and since the merchant had had it made especially for her, she was able to find the house of her beloved. The writer Alberto Tosefe is a specialist in the legends of Venice. What is this building? This is the Fondaco dei Turchi, the Inn of the Turks. The name comes from the Arabic word Fonduk. In Venice, international merchants were lodged in edifices like this that were used both as houses and warehouses. There was one for the Turks along the Grand Canal as well as one for the Germans. There was a similar Fondaco for the Persians and the Arabs. This proves that the Venetians did not separate people from the East according to their religion, but instead according to their national Turks, Arabs, Persians. The history of Venice's ties to the East is not only written on the walls of its buildings, it's also recounted by word of mouth. Alberto, you've published entire collections of stories from the oral traditions of Venice. Are any of them about the person who fascinates me the most in connection with the Silk Road, Marco Polo? Well, yes. There's one about Marco Polo when he returns to Venice. At some point he has to return, and according to the legend, he comes back with a Chinese wife, who is one of Kublai Khan's youngest daughters. They had fallen in love and gotten married. A Chinese princess? Yes, that's right. He brings back nothing less than a Chinese princess. She's not happy here because she's so different, let's just say. And she doesn't feel accepted by her husband's family. And so... La mamma italiana, his Italian mother, didn't like the Chinese girl. Right. And so when Marco is taken prisoner after the Battle of Curzola, the news gets back to Venice. Instead of telling her the truth, that is, that he was imprisoned, they tell the girl that Marco had died. 
E così, so, as the story goes, she immolates herself by setting fire to her garments and then throwing herself into the canal from the window of the house. She drowned herself in the canal because Marco Polo was dead. She had a beautiful voice. According to the legend, Marco fell in love with her because he heard her singing in the gardens of the palace. And even today, as this romantic Venetian legend tells us, if you go up on the bridge that still bears his name, Marco Polo, which is near the house where our traveler lived, Del Milione? That's right. You might hear, on a summer night, a soft, sweet song. And they say that it's Marco's wife who's singing, knowing that she is loved in return. Oh, that's very sad. It is. <laughs> In the lagoon, there is an island that is so entirely devoted to the east that it even became a sanctuary. It's the island of San Lazaro. In the 18th century, this monastery was given by the Republic of Venice to a group of monks from Armenia who were fleeing Turkish persecution. For many centuries, the former kingdoms of Armenia were allied with the Venetians and the Europeans. They were even ruled by a dynasty of knights, the House of Lusignan, who'd come from Poitou, France, during the Crusades. Coming from an ancient branch of Eastern Christianity, the Armenian monks sought to preserve the great cultural traditions of the Silk Road. Their collection is now one of the richest in the world. It was after a very thorough reading of Marco Polo's account of his travels along the Silk Road that a Venetian monk, Fra Mauro, decided to draw a map, the first map of the old world. His work would turn Venice into an international map-making center. The first globes will be created here, including this one. The prosperity of Venice's cartography studios shows the extent to which the city's fortunes were linked to those of the Silk Road. In fact, they would both start to decline after the 16th century when international trade routes were rerouted towards the Atlantic Ocean. After the fall of Constantinople, it was Venice that became the keeper of the flame, says Professor Alberto Paratone. In your opinion, is the legacy Byzantine or does it come more from the Silk Road? Both, because the two of them go hand in hand. The Silk Road was intricately linked to the commercial interests of the Middle East, which is what made Byzantium an important point of reference. One couldn't exist without the other. The two were interconnected. Venice is thus like the bridgehead of a long chain of connections with the East. Professor Peritone, who specializes in the movement of ideas, teaches metaphysics at the university. He's also the chief archivist for the extraordinary library on San Lazaro. How many works are there in this magnificent library? Approximately 170,000 books in different collections, in both Western and Eastern languages, many in Armenian, of course, but also in Arabic and other Eastern languages, such as Persian or Syriac, as well as all the major Western languages. After the congregation moved to Venice, it would start to do a lot of translation work, which has continued up to the present day, translating Eastern works into Western languages and Western works into Eastern languages. It's a way of promoting a mutual exchange of knowledge between the cultures of these two worlds, which have two different interpretations of the Christian tradition, the Latin world and the Eastern world, and whose resources mutually enrich each other. Could we say that the Armenians acted as go-betweens between the East and the West? Yes. So there was an exchange which wasn't only of material things, of objects, of wealth, of material resources, but also, and I'd say above all, of knowledge, which is what helps culture develop in an all-around way. In addition to its books, the monastery's collection includes an unusual assortment of miscellaneous scholarly and orientalist artifacts. 
For example, this astonishing 4,000-year-old Egyptian mummy, or this marquetry work from Damascus, antique porcelain from China, and these miniatures from Persia. Venice may be the most beautiful city in the world, but it's also an invitation to take off to explore other lands. Marco Polo and many other Venetian merchants and adventurers were not content to stay put. They set out to seek their fortune across the deserts and over the mountains of the Silk Road, if only to return home later to the dreamy lagoon and bask once more in the mirage of La Serenissima. <laughs> 